to wish all of our mothers and mothers-to-be a happy Mother's Day today. I know it's a special day for you. and uh, I tried to think some last night. I'm not going to preach this morning concerning mothers. Uh, the Lord's placed something else in my heart, but as, even as I was thinking before I went to bed last night that uh, I know that if there were not mothers that uh, there would not be children. I understand that. Uh, but you think about that, casting that aside, what would the world be without mothers? It would be a much different place and, and not in a good way. And so mothers are certainly very precious to all of us. And I know some of your mothers have already gone into eternity. And I know you look forward to the day when uh, you get to see them again. If they've gone to be with the Lord and you've made plans to be with the Lord. And uh, thankful for mothers that we still have around that we can still uh, go to and we can look to and enjoy one another's uh, presence. Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we're also thankful for the visitors that are here this morning. I know some of you have come to be with family. We're thankful that you're here. I want to read this card to the church while you're turning to Luke chapter 9. It says, our thanks to you with warmest thanks, grateful hearts, and deep appreciation for your thoughtfulness. It says, I loved my church family before, the hardest time in my life, and after I love you more. I cannot express how thankful I am for everything that was done to show me, my family, and my mom the love of Christ. I will forever be grateful. I love you all, Ashley Welch and family. So we appreciate the sweet card there from that family. Let's continue to remember them. Verse 10, I want to just read two verses here in this chapter. I want to go ahead and say this. I know I alluded to it just a minute ago, and maybe even in the prayer request, that uh, the burden of my heart this morning is to those who have never trusted Christ as their Savior. And you may have come looking for a Mother's Day message this morning, and you just have to take that up with the Lord because uh, I'm not going to just preach a Mother's Day message just because it's Mother's Day if he hasn't placed it on my heart. Uh, but he has placed this on my heart, and I have the responsibility to uh, seek his will and to preach that. But this morning, if you're here and you're lost, my goodness, I'd like to see you saved, but you ought to want to see yourself saved. You know, it'd bring joy to all of our hearts today if we could, you know, leave saying that someone, uh, whether it be a young person, a middle-aged, an older person, whether you're a church member, you're not a church member, uh, I'm, I'm asking you, you saved, you know the Lord. And so today, while it would bring joy to our hearts, that it would be the greatest day of your life up to this point if you would come and humble yourself today and see who you are in the sight of God and that you would accept his provision for you that's been made through Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm going to try to just preach a very simple thought this morning. And uh, I, I just got a burden in my heart. I'd like to see you saved. And I can't save you. Nobody else can save you. But the Lord can. And uh, like I said, you can leave out of here uh, di different than you came if you'll trust him. Verse 10. I'm not going to give a lot of the background of this passage because really I just want to take a, 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 a thought out of a phrase that's given to us here. And the apostles, Luke chapter 9, verse 10. And when the apostles and the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done, and he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. Now, the, I want to ask a question just for a thought this morning. Uh, you say, well, there's not much here to take a thought from. I want to take my thought from the last phrase that's mentioned to us in verse 11. He, it says this, that he healed them that had need of healing. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. And I want to ask you a question. Is there anybody here that, today that needs healing? Is there anybody here today that needs healing? It said Jesus healed those that had need of healing. Now, I know there are some of you here that suffer from physical maladies and ailments and problems. And no doubt that you could say that, you know, physically, that, yes, yeah, sure, that, you know, I'd love to be healed. I would love to be cured of that disease or that problem that I have. There's none of us that desire to be sick. 
you know, the feeling, I don't like that feeling when you know you're getting sick. I've been blessed. I never have been sick a lot in my life. I just thank the Lord. I'm not going to knock on wood because, you know, I'm thankful to the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, I'm probably not a very good patient. My wife could probably vouch for that. I don't like being sick. It just, it almost makes me mad when I get sick. And, and to know, when you, you know you're coming down with it, you know for several days that you're not going to feel like doing anything. And that's just not, certainly not a, a, a good feeling. We all want to be uh, well. And I believe that we should pray for healing if it's the Lord's will for us and for those of our loved ones who are sick. And yet we also find in the Bible that I believe that we can bear this out in the scriptures that the Lord can use sickness to teach us things that we can't learn any other way. And, and don't, don't ever think just because somebody's sick that it's because that they've done something wrong. That, that's foolish. We shouldn't, shouldn't think that way. But in our, in our sickness, whether it be, you know, a three-day sickness or a month sickness or maybe a person be sick for years, I can promise you something that the Lord's allowed it to come that way and what he allows to come our way that he's able to use it for good and so that we should always seek to uh, to learn that and, and, and to be taught that the Lord would have to teach us now we know that Jesus healed physical sicknesses we all understand that and uh, I was thinking even this morning as I was up early and I was studying uh, that a lot of the things that they suffered from in the time of Christ are things that we still have today. But for us, a lot of times, those same sicknesses that would be chronic things to them, things that would even cause death in a lot of circumstances for them, we can go to the doctor and get a shot or get an antibiotic or have a surgery or whatever the case might be, and that we can... Uh, be, be cured of that or be, be healed of that or that problem be made better. But in those days that, you know, they just didn't have that option in, in many cases. And so for many of these people that the only hope that they had was to go to one who claimed to be able to heal. And we know that Jesus was one uh, who was able to heal. And he desired to heal people of their physical sicknesses. That was one way that, that, that he prove to the people he didn't have to prove to God because he is God and God sent him here but one way that he one of the ways that he proved to mankind that he is the Christ is that he had power over sickness he had power over disease now let's go back I'm not going to just turn to it's maybe just a ton of places this morning but go back in the gospels to Matthew chapter 9 Matthew chapter 9 I want to deal with this physical sickness for just a minute and then like I said the main gist of the message this morning it's those that need spiritual healing. But think about the statement that he healed them that had need of healing. He healed them that had need of healing. That simple statement that the, the gospel writer gives us, that Jesus healed those that needed healing, that had need of healing. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says this, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, the, we know Jesus is the great physician. Did Jesus ever tell somebody, you need to go see a specialist? You ever heard that? Well, you just need to, let me refer you to somebody else. That's uh, out of the range of what I ordinarily deal with. Uh, I've not had a lot of experience in, that, you know, in this particular problem. I don't do this surgery. This is, you know, this is not in, in my area of expertise. But Jesus never did that. It said whatever sickness that they had, whatever disease that they had, that Jesus was able to heal them and go back to the go back in your mind let's don't turn back there just right this moment but go back in your mind to the statement that Luke made in Luke chapter 9 that he healed them that had need of healing he healed them that had need of healing what was the success rate of Jesus' healing it was a hundred percent wasn't it everyone that came to Jesus believing that he was able to heal them that they left 
healed. Don't you wish that you could go to a doctor and he would be able to heal you of whatever that you needed a cure for? That'd be wonderful. And we understand that that's not the case here uh, in this world. But, but look at this statement again in Matthew chapter 9. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So just, just bear with me. That it said that he healed every sickness and every disease among the people. So there's nothing that he was unable to heal. There was no problem that was too big for him. There was no cancer that was too far along. There was no leprosy that had reached the stage that he said, I can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unable to do anything for you now. If you'd have come to me, you know, six months ago, we could have done something about it. So it said he healed every disease and every sickness among the people. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer this in your mind. You don't, don't answer it out loud. But were there still sick people in Israel? He went from the cities and villages, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And yet, that y'all are shaking your head that there were still sick people there. There were still people that had problems. There were still people that were blind. There were still people that were lame. There were still people that were, were crippled. There were still people that were deaf and dumb. So, yes, there were still sick people there. But you had one that could heal everything. Go back to the book of Luke, chapter 4, I believe it is. Luke chapter 4. Verse 27. We'll just read the one verse. Luke chapter 4, verse 27. Now, I know this is Old Testament. Or he's, Christ is giving an Old Testament example. He's talking about the unbelief of his own people. But notice what he says here in verse 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisius or Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving or except Naaman the Syrian. We all know that story of Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, a great man, an honorable man, one that had done great things, and he was one that was well respected. Uh, he, he was one that had, had great accolades. He was decorated as, as a military man. But what does it say about him? But he was a leper. We know that, but he was a leper. And so this little maid that he has that waiting on his wife that she says, you know, if, if he could go back to Israel, there's a prophet there that could heal him. And as he sat back there, and we know that the prophet doesn't even go out, but he sends his servant out and he says, go and wash in Jordan seven times. And the, after the seventh time, when you come up, he said, you'll be cleansed of this. And, and, and Naaman was wroth about these things. He thought there was a better way. And, and yet finally the, they got through to him. Look, if the servant had told you to do some, or the prophet had told you to do some great thing, he said, you would have done it. He told you something very simple. He said, why don't you just go do do it and you'll be cleansed. Nathan, uh, Naaman humbled himself. He went there. He washed in Jordan and he was cleansed. His leprosy was gone. But it says here that there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. But it says the only one that was healed was Naaman. Now think about that for a minute. What does that tell you? That, said, that lets us know this. All the lepers had the opportunity, didn't they? They could have all been healed as, Na as, as Naaman was healed. But why weren't they healed? It was one thing. It was a lack of faith in God, lack of belief in what God was able to do. So why were there still sick people in Jesus' day? It's the same reason. They didn't see the need of coming to Jesus Christ for healing. Now let's try to bring all this full circle this morning. Luke said that he healed them that had need of healing. He healed them that had need of healing. Now, when he talks about those that had need, is he talking about those that God knew had a need or those who understood for themselves that I have a need? Well, it's the second. It's those that understand that I have a need. Those are the ones that came to Christ for healing. He healed them that had a need of healing. He healed them that saw the need in my life that I need healing. I need cleansing. I need deliverance. And so they came to one that was able to heal them. Now listen to me. If you're here this morning, you're lost very, very carefully. 
God knows that you need a Savior. Let me go a step further. God knows who's here that's lost and who's here that's saved this morning. But let's take it a step further. God knows those who have not yet reached the age of accountability. And we understand that they're covered by the blood. They're safe up until the time when the Lord will deal with them. He knows those who have not yet come to that place in their life. And he knows those who have. And nobody else here in this room has that knowledge. Because the age of accountability is not a certain age. It's not 12 years old. It's not 10 years old or 8 years old or 13 years old. It, it, it's a point in a person's life when the Lord reveals to them their need of a Savior. It's a, it's a point of accountability. So God knows all those things. And He knows what your need is and He knows what my need is. And He's revealed that to each individual that's here. See, individually, you know where you stand with God. From Brother Johnny all the way around the building, back here to Brother Nathan, every one of you know where you stand with God. I know where I stand with God. If you be honest with yourself, you know where you stand with God. And God knows what you need. But what God's waiting on is for you to admit what you need, for you to acknowledge what I need. You see, that's what Naaman knew he needed help, didn't he, Brother Adrian? And that's why he received healing, and all these other people didn't. It's because Naaman humbled himself and did what God said for him to do through the prophet. And he received that healing. A lot of you kids, you've grown up in good homes. You don't do things other kids do. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't carry on, you don't cheat, you know, you, you, you don't get marks at school or demerits or get sent to the office or, or, or all of these things. But be careful. Be very, very careful that you don't look down at others and say, well, they need something, but I don't need it. I don't need it. Uh, let me use an example. I mentioned my sister-in-law. Her mother's been diagnosed with cancer, and uh, I shared this with some of you. I won't go through all the details, but uh, my sister-in-law is, is very, she's a very particular person. The way, the way she, you know, she, the way she looks, the way that her house looks, the way that, I mean, everything's just to a T. She's just that way. Everything's got to be in order. And I think she must have got it from her mother. Her mother's the same way. And uh, I, I guess I've never seen her mother when she just wasn't just fixed to a T. Uh, she, she tries to take care of herself, I believe. She's, you know, she's, not, she's not overweight. She's not, she's not, she doesn't, I don't think she does a lot of things that would cause health problems and, and those things. And uh, several weeks ago that she found out that she had a spot that was cancerous. And so they told her that, uh, you know, this is, we feel this is pretty treatable. Here's what we need to do. Here's the process we're going to go through. And, uh, you know, hopefully that we get done with that and it'll, you'll be cured of that. But they said, before we do it, we need to do a PET scan just to make sure there's no other cancer in your body. And they did a PET scan, stage four liver cancer, all over her liver. How many symptoms has she had? Zero. How many days has she felt bad? Zero. <laughs> the picture of hell still working. I mean, not that old. Why, why do you say that? Why do you use that for an example? Because if you'd have told her a month ago that she had stage four cancer, she'd have probably argued you down. Nothing wrong with me. Because, no doubt, and I think she's in the medical profession, but she, she probably had the idea, I, I've been around people with stage 4 cancer. I know what people with stage 4 cancer 
You know, I, I know the symptoms. I know what they, what they look like. I know how they feel. I know these things. I, I, don't, I don't have that. But when that test was done and that doctor came in and said, here's the results. Here's what you have. She's got one of two choices. She could argue with the doctor, so you don't know what you're talking about. Or she could look at it and she could say, here's the facts. <laughs> and I believe it. And I'm going to see if I can be healed of this. Doctor, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to, to fight this? And what the doctors prescribes is just very, very intense uh, chemo. And uh, no doubt it, it's going to make her sick. And, and it, it's going to be difficult for her to go through this. Why has she submitted to that? For one reason. It was proven to her that she has this cancer. Even though she can't see it. Even though it's not caused her any symptoms. She has believed that this is my real condition. And so therefore, I'm willing to submit myself to this in the hopes that I can get better. And y'all pray for her. But do you see where I'm going with this? You precious young people that sit here today, you may not do all of those things. You may do the things you're supposed to. You may try to do right. I don't need healing. He healed them that had need of healing, but I, I don't need it. I'm good. Oh, hey. I say it sometimes, but yeah, I just cringe sometimes when people say, I'm good. I don't need what you have to offer. I'm good. I'm good. Go back to Matthew chapter 9 if you would. Listen to me, lost sinner, just for, for just a minute. I'm not going to read you every verse in the Bible. Let me just give you two or three verses, two or three places. Do you need healing today? It said Christ healed everyone. Every single one that came to him that had need of healing, he healed them. And yet many people walked sick, diseased, lame, blind. Why were there still those people there? Because they didn't come to him for healing, for whatever reason. Matthew chapter 9. Let's see, uh, verse 12. Question was asked in verse 11, why did Jesus eat with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now go down to the, the, the end of verse 13. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now think about that. He said they that are whole don't need the doctor. They don't need a physician. But they that are sick, okay? So he uses physical terms there, sickness and, 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 and wellness. And then he applies that spiritually in verse 13. He said he didn't come to call the righteous. Now, who are the righteous in verse 12? The whole, right? W-H-O-L-E, the whole. They're, de they're, they're described as being whole in verse 12 and being righteous in verse 13. In verse 13, who are the sinners? In verse 12, they're described as being the sick. Those that have need of the physician. Those that have need of the doctor. So he said, the ones that I can help are the ones who are the sinners. He said, those who are righteous, they don't need me for salvation. Do uh, you remember in Luke chapter 15, I believe it is, the 90 and 9, the shepherd left to go get the one that was lost? What was the statement that was made there? 90 and 9 had no need of repentance. You know why? Because they weren't sick. 
They were the ones already in the fold. They were the righteous ones. But he said there was one that had need of repentance. There was one who was, was out of the fold. And so that he says here that the righteous are the ones who are well, but the sinners are those who are sick. Answer this question in your mind this morning. Every, everybody sitting here, whether you're a church member or not, old or young, doesn't matter, male or female, are you righteous in the sight of God? God looks at you, what does he see? Does he see a sinner? Or does he see righteousness? I'm not talking about what you've done. I'm talking about when God looks at your heart and he looks at your soul. What does he see? You say, well, what does the word righteous mean? It means holy. It means innocent. It means being as Christ is. Sinless. Now, none of, us, none of us are sinless in our flesh. In fact, go, go to the book of Romans. Let's just read a few verses of Scripture. Romans chapter 3. So, again, think about this question. Is there anybody here that needs healing? Luke said he healed every one of them that came to him for healing. Every last one that, that needed healing, Christ healed. Do you need healing? Are you righteous? Or are you a sinner? I don't know, preacher. Verse 10. Let's read verse 9. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. It says, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. That's everybody. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. What he's talking about there is inherently, there's nobody that's righteous, there's nobody that's perfect, there's nobody that's sinless, there's nobody that's holy. There's none righteous, no, not one. No matter how good you are, no matter what you do or you don't do, no matter who your parents are, no matter where you go to church, I could go on. He says in verse 11, there's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Do you need healing? Are you sick? Well, he said here, everybody needs healing. He said here, all men are sinners. In fact, go down toward the end of the or a little later on down in the chapter, drop down to verse uh, 23. He says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All includes you. I don't know how else to say that. We know John 3, 16, that God sent Christ in the world to save whosoever. Whosoever means anybody. He could have said, save all. So he said, here, all have sinned. Put your name there. For Brent has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The fact that I've sinned, that's just simply evidence that I'm a sinner. All that is. Cody has sinned. Come short of the glory of God. Krista has sinned. Come short of the glory of God. I could, I could call everybody's name here, and I won't do that this morning. But every one of you have sinned. And you come short of the glory of God. In fact, Jesus would make the statement in the Sermon on the Mount that except your righteousnesses exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And outwardly, they were the most righteous people in the world. They made sure that everything that they did outwardly was according to the law. But he said, you've got to be better than them. You think you're going to make it on your own. And of course, that what Jesus was saying was not that, well, you can do it. He was saying was you can't do it. Because for those people, the scribes and the Pharisees were thought of as being the, the most holy, righteous people in the world. So you're a sinner. You're separated from God. You're dead, trespasses and sins. 
But we read in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, being justified by faith. What does the word justified mean? It means to be declared righteous. Oh, well, that's good news now. They that are whole don't need the physician, but those who are sick. I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So sinners are those who are the unrighteous. And he said that those who are righteous, they don't need the physician. They've already been healed. So how do you become righteous? Well, I can do enough things to become righteous. I can go to church enough to become righteous. I can help people enough to be righteous. I can give enough to be righteous. No. He said here the only way that you can be righteous is that somebody has to do it for you. He says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can declare you to be righteous. And his plan is that he only declares those who are righteous those who trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. So being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me this morning. I'm not going to take time to read a lot of other scriptures to you. I'm going to turn one place in the Old Testament before I close. Back in the book of Jeremiah. If you want to go ahead and turn back there, Jeremiah chapter 8, I believe it is. Yeah, Jeremiah chapter 8. Luke said Jesus healed them that had need of healing. This morning, do you have need of healing? Jesus still heals those who have need of healing. And that's the wonderful thing about it. There is a remedy. There is hope. The problem is that people don't see themselves as in need. You know, I, I don't need healing. Or people say, well, I can get it another way. You know, I, I can get it by doing. But the Bible says by the works of law, of the law, no man is justified in the eyes of God. So that's just the facts. So today, listen to me. Listen to me, young people. You may not feel like a sinner. You may not have a rap sheet on you. In fact, down at the office at the school, you may not have any write-ups in your file. You may have straight A's. You may be star student. Whatever. The Bible says you're a sinner. And that's what matters is that what God says. It's just like that woman with, with no symptoms, with no pain, yet that she, she is yielding herself over to the doctors because they have proven to her that you have a terrible sickness. and You need healing. This morning, no matter how you might feel, by the authority of the Word of God, you need Jesus. You need the Lord. Now, in just a minute, we're going to sing an invitation song. And probably as we sing that invitation song, there'll be many other churches in this country. They'll also be singing an invitation song. And today, I believe I'm safe to say this. I believe across the United States, there'll be many today that receive spiritual healing. There will be many today who trust Christ as their Savior. There will be many today that years down the road as they give their testimony of salvation, they'll go back to this Mother's Day, 2019, that they saw themselves as who they truly were and they accepted the healing that Christ had to offer. But you know the sad part is? There'll probably be more than that that's, that understand the same thing. I know I'm lost. I understand what the Bible says that I'm a sinner. But they don't come to the Lord for healing. And they're going to leave lost. And so as Jesus said that there were many lepers in that day, but there was only one healed. Are you going to be the one that walks out today lost? Are you going to be the one that comes to Christ? 
he healed them that had need of healing. I can promise you today that if you, if you see yourself in need of healing and in your heart, if you'll believe and you'll trust Christ as your Savior, you'll receive that healing. Jeremiah chapter 8, let's read this. And then Brother Steve, come get us a song. Verse 20. Well, let's just go to verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? What's balm? It's medicine. Is there not a cure? Is there no physician there? Is there not somebody that can administer that? Is there not somebody that can diagnose your trouble? Is there not, is there not only someone that can diagnose your trouble, but he can give you what you need? The answer, sure there is. Yes, there is. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And then he asked this, why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? You know what he's saying? Why are they still lost? Why are they still lost? If there was no cure for the disease, then he said, I, I would understand. But there's, there's cure. He healed them that had need of healing. Do you see your need of a Savior this morning? If you do, right now, if you'll trust Him, He will save your soul. Let's have a song. I'd love for you, if you trusted Christ, to come make it known to follow the Lord in baptism, to make a profession before the world that I'm a child of God, and then to get busy serving Him. But more than baptism, you need, to, you need to know that you're saved. To walk out of here today knowing you have a need and yet not doing anything about it is to gamble with your eternity and gamble with your soul. Oh, what a, what a tragic thing it would be if you were to leave here today knowing there's a cure, there's healing, and you leave. And maybe even before you get home that your life will be taken. If you had the opportunity... There was a physician, there was a cure. Would you have him this morning? Let's, let's have a song. Something on your heart, you come.